So let's talk a little bit more about intermittent fasting, which you just touched on with the two professionals you have. Um, and this is more of like calorie, you're still eating, but you're calorie restricting and experiencing some benefits. So talk to us a little bit about that. And we definitely want to hear more about that chronobiology, um, all that fancy science. Yeah. And you know, what's so interesting, you know, we'll get into some of the fancy science, but you know, um, What's, uh, what's so interesting, when you look really at what we're recommending, it's a simple recommendation. You know, it's, you're eating more of your, your food in the morning, uh, you're stopping eating at, at night, and you're, that's, that's the essence of all of the science that we're going to talk about. You know, it's, it's, it's very simple. <laughs> you know, so I love Sir Richard Branson, who's an amazing entrepreneur. Uh, you know, he always approaches a problem and he sees a simple solution. Then he dives in and, and digs out the complexity of you know all understanding that simple solution, so that he can create uh, something that is achievable for people, you know, an easy interface. <clears throat> and so that's what we're trying to do here. We're going to talk a lot about some of the, the amazing science around intermittent fasting and chronobiology and all these big words. But ultimately, it is, you know, uh, eating a little bit later in the morning, stopping eating by early dinner, and that's it. That's the solution. So intermittent fasting, Dr. Walter Longo and others have discovered this incredible, um, you know, uh, complexity of biochemistry all the way down to our, you know, our epigenome and our chromosomes that are impacted by the timing of our food. And so they discovered that if somebody um, will eat their calories, you know, in a, uh, a window that's either 12 hours or eight hours, some even, you know, whittle that window down to a four hour window during the day um, with a longer period of time not eating uh, after that, that last meal until the next meal. It, again, it's like the, what we talked about with water only fasting. It gives the body an opportunity to process the food, to begin healing itself uh, and to regulate other system processes rather than this you know, constant barrage of digestive effort and metabolic effort to process food, to package food, and to send food to different parts of the body. Um, Dr. Longo discovered in mice that intermittent fasting extends life. And still today, you know, it's the only studied lifestyle intervention that has been shown to create longevity is through uh, intermittent fasting and fasting. Um, we know through you know, other lifestyle intervention research, but especially through the intermittent fasting, that when we do this, there are little um, caps on our chromosomes called telomeres. It's like the plastic cap on your shoelace. And they found that with intermittent fasting, that little cap gets longer. And that's interesting because when we have diseases, when we have chronic inflammation, depression, and even poor lifestyle, those caps shorten over time and it's, uh, it's related to or associated to a shorter lifespan and more um, lifestyle-related diseases. So the intermittent fasting impacts the chromosomes, it reduces inflammation, it reduces blood pressure, it reduces cholesterol levels. They have even found that by you know, shifting more of your calories to upfront in the day, your body automatically reduces its cholesterol production. Uh, and it's not uncommon by just shifting calories to the front end of the day and not eating after dinner to have a 20 point reduction in your cholesterol by, by this intermittent fasting. Um, they also found, which is also you know, interesting, that Powerful. even a 24 hour fast turns off cholesterol production by 95%. So it's an incredible way wow. to like, you know, bring your cholesterol levels down naturally by just changing the timing of our eating. Uh, we see amazing, you know, uh, when you change the timing of your eating and you're eating in a smaller window, um, it changes the, even the number of calories that your body absorbs during that time. It's like your body recognizes that it doesn't need as many calories and it pushes calories along through the digestive system that don't even get absorbed into your body. So it's not even like calories in that calories become a part of our body. The body is uh, kind of in, in an intelligent way regulating the number of calories, which directly will impact blood sugar levels as well. Let's give our audience some practical tips here 
of exactly how they can get started. How do you suggest if somebody has not implemented intermittent fasting in their life yet, what is the best way to get started? Yeah, you know, I've learned through the years that uh, any time that we're trying to make a change, you just keep it simple and start with a simple, achievable first step. So the first step for anybody that's never done fasting is just don't eat after dinner. That's like the easiest way to get started on this whole intermittent fasting route. You know, we have breakfast, we can have lunch, we can have dinner. If you just make dinner your last, the last thing you put in your mouth is the last bite of food on your dinner plate. Then you have a cup of tea, brush your teeth, and don't eat till breakfast. You've already started intermittent fasting. Because for most of us, that's going to be, you know, almost 12 hours before we eat again. And so you've created like almost a 12-12 intermittent fasting routine by simply not eating after dinner. That's the easiest, most practical way to start. You know, from there, you can tighten it up a little bit more by, you know, pushing your breakfast a little bit later and getting to maybe a 16-8 window, which has a little bit more benefit, 16 hours off, 8 hours on. But the simplest way is just don't eat after dinner. That has so many benefits. Um, and that's the easiest way to start. And after dinner, just drink some water, have a cup of tea. I like to brush my teeth after dinner. That's, that always helps me uh, know <laughs> that I, I finished eating. I mean, my teeth are clean. I flossed and brushed, and I'm just going to wait till morning to eat again. Okay, I love this suggestion so much, and I want to throw in just a little bit of a pro tip for anybody who is using fast-acting insulin, okay, again, that could be type 1, type 1.5, type 2, insulin-dependent, if you can accomplish exactly what Dr. Stoll just said, this is a huge, huge benefit to help you improve your blood glucose control while you're sleeping. And if you want to improve your A1C, you want to improve your time and range, if you can make an impact on that, that sleep, the sleeping number, the blood glucose control while you're sleeping, that's like a third of your day, you can have a huge impact. So, if you are using fast-acting insulin at your dinner meal, dose conservatively. If you take a s less than you think, so you're going to ride a little bit high. You're like, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I don't take too much insulin. That will then allow you to do what Dr. Skoll just said. You can brush your teeth because you'll be very confident you're probably not going to need a snack. You're not going to need to treat a low. And you might need a tiny, tiny correction before going to bed or no correction at all. And then you go into bed just cruising, all right? You have, you have this stable reading. You haven't taken fast-acting insulin for, you know, four or five hours, depending on what time you go to bed. That's going to help you keep your blood glucose more stable overnight. Anytime you have a late-night snack and you have to inject fast-acting insulin, that makes your blood glucose control while sleeping just twice as difficult you know you the more you can avoid that it's better for a lot of reasons including all the benefits that dr stole just taught us today about fasting in general so thank you for that tip i really appreciate it